again, I'd like to uh, express our gratitude for your uh, tuning in to this study of God's Word. We're presently in the book of Romans, getting close to the end of it, but uh, still not there yet. Before we start, though, uh, let's have a short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, bless the study of thy word. Father, may we be of the mind that we will not only learn thy word, but come what may, we will obey thy will that is contained therein. Since thy will is disclosed there, we pray that each of us may be diligent students of thy word to learn what it has to say to us and, and how it is to guide our lives in this old troubled world. Be with us always and keep us in our care. And we're grateful for the Savior whose gospel we follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> we started uh, chapter 13 uh, last week. And we covered the first three verses, but just kind of to uh, uh, refresh our memories. Uh, uh, chapter 13 is talking about civil, civil governments. <clears throat> and we understand that the, uh, the Jews didn't like any civil governments at all. You know, they wanted to be governed by the, uh, the old law and not any uh, uh, law of uh, foreign governments, and of course, at the time this uh, epistle was written, <clears throat> they were subject to the uh, Roman government. They didn't like it at all. And but also, not only that, uh, but just Christians, even Gentile Christians, when they became Christians, they uh, had uh, allegiance to a new king, spiritual king, but a new king. So they may have been somewhat antagonistic to civil governments at all. Uh, also, Paul's correcting this. He's saying that civil governments are necessary. You know, the, uh, the Jews of old were governed by the uh, law of Moses, who was both a spiritual and a, a civil law. <clears throat> but that was done away with. So the intention was that from uh, here on out, uh, Christians and heathen alike were going to be uh, governed by civil law. That is, in their relationship with uh, uh, one another, their uh, commercial relationships, and, and so forth. You, you got to have civil government. Of course, we're all subject to the uh, law of Christ, and that is to be our guide and our conduct, but uh, you know, and without civil government, then we would have anarchy where everybody is his own government. And that's just not going to work. <clears throat> so Paul is trying to correct that uh, tendency for uh, Jewish Christians and new Christians to dismiss the uh, need for uh, government, civil government. So he's uh, reminding them of that and we get down to uh, verse uh, three <clears throat> he says uh, rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil do you want to be unafraid of authority do what is good and you will have praise from the same <clears throat> so in general not always but in general civil governments do not, uh, they, they don't have any reason uh, to oppress those that are doing good. Of course, it's as they define good, but still the fact remains in general. Uh, you know, if you, if you do good, you don't have any fear from uh, uh, rulers. <clears throat> and we know that government is not perfect. You know, we certainly can see that today, but the exceptions don't invalidate the uh, principle. Uh, so let's keep in mind that we are to uh, observe the authority that civil governments have. 
in verse 4, he says, For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister. An avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So the ruler, civil government, if you will, is appointed by God to be a minister of good for you. This assumes that government is not itself engaged in evil or totally engaged in evil because we know we know that just the very nature of government, a lot of government officials are engaged in evil. But if the government in general is doing good, but you are the one doing evil, then you should uh, fear government, governmental authority. From ancient times, uh, a sword was a emblem or badge of the authority with which the civil officer was invested. If instead of living a life of uprightness and peace, you're found uh, to be arraying yourself against the constituted authorities of the country in which you reside and resisting the civil officers when they are carrying out their appointed duties, then you should be afraid. Since they are appointed to their duties by God, God has not pledged his protection to you from officials of the state carrying out their God-appointed duties. This is the reason that they carry the sword. That is, this is the reason that they exercise the authority invested in them from the state. <clears throat> God's servant is a civil servant who is the appointed avenger of the state to punish all wrongs perpetrated against it. It does this by inflicting both divine and state anger on the evildoer. <clears throat> now, I'll, I'll add a little aside here that when uh, perpetrators are not afraid of the civil authorities, then the social fabric of society breaks down. The care to its ultimate end, anarchy is a result. <clears throat> In verse uh, 5, therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience's sake. It is necessary to be obedient to ruling authorities for two reasons, punishment and conscience. Punishment or wrath becomes a reason that induces the obedience. We must obey to escape the punishment. Beyond that, we must be obedient that our conscience may be left at ease. Our conscience is our sense of right and wrong formed by the word of God. It is God's word that tells us that ruling authorities are servants of his, ordained by him to assure the proper conduct of society. In verse 6 of chapter 13, for because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. <clears throat> if civil governments are, are ordained by God, and they are, then so are taxes, for our government cannot function without resources to pay for the services it provides. A government acts through its civil servants, including tax collectors, all of whom must be paid. <clears throat> In verse uh, 7, render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs are due, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Jesus said that we are to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, Matthew 
22nd uh, chapter, verse 21, Mark 12, 17, and Luke 20, verse 25. <clears throat> this has a specific reference to taxes, duties, tributes, and the like levied on the people. Taxes are direct taxes on a person or his property. Customs are levy, levies on commercial transactions such as imports, exports, and other trade and goods and services. Fear of what government officials can do should be a sufficient motivation to compliance with tax law. <clears throat> Not only fear, but the Christian must respect the government officials for sake of the duties that the government official must perform for the government to function smoothly. Obligations set forth here cannot rightly be treated with contempt by the faithful Christian. <clears throat> In verse 8, owe no one anything except to love, and that's the uh, acapeo uh, form of love, except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Oh, no tax, no custom, no fear, no honor. Pay all to whom these things are due. This is not saying that debt cannot be incurred, such as a mortgage, car loan, and so forth. A mortgage, for example, is due monthly, not all at once. Accordingly, if payments are made when due, one is compliance with the injunction, owe no one anything. Debt is dangerous when abused and beneficial when not. The accepted clause, except to love one another, states that there is a debt that we owe and we'll be, we'll be paying continually. One means of paying this debt is to never do the things mentioned in verse 9 following. Jesus said we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Matthew 19 verse 19 and 22 verse 39, Mark 12 verse 31. <clears throat> but uh, what law is fulfilled? Uh, this phrase does not signify law in general, nor necessarily the law of Moses, but the, the law, that's any law relating to me and another, as was said, to love our neighbor as ourselves. James said it well when he wrote, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as though who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It's found in the second chapter of James, verses 8 through 13. <clears throat> In verse 9 of chapter 13 of Romans, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall lo love your neighbor as yourself. Now this uh, verse, of course, is connected to the preceding verse. The connection is he who loves another has fulfilled the law towards him for you shall not do the things listed here since it demonstrates a lack of love 
one another, quote unquote. The commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is the sum and substance of the things said previously. It is not necessary to love your neighbor more than yourself, or that it is neither possible nor necessary. We are to love our neighbor with the same care and concern that we have for ourselves. This is not to do for others what they can and should do for themselves. Doing things for them of which they are capable makes them unnecessarily and detrimentally dependent on others. As Jesus said, quote unquote, as just and just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise, Luke six chapter verse thirty one. <clears throat> Would we want others to infringe upon our self sufficiency? A healthy response would be no. Consider the Samaritan. He helped one who was incapable of helping himself. So go go and do likewise. <clears throat> Verse 10 of chapter 13. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. As stated, the law requires me not to murder my neighbor, neighbor, not to steal from him, not to commit adultery against him, and not to desire his good. If I love him, I will not do him any harm of any kind. On the contrary, I will seek his highest good. In verse 11 of chapter 13, and, and do this knowing the time, in the ASB as season, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. <clears throat> and do the things already enjoined, that, that is, be obedient to ruling authorities, pay taxes that are due, love our neighbor. The phrase knowing the time, especially the, the word time, that uh, comes from three Greek words. The time portion is called the heroes, and that's opposed to chronos, which we'll talk about a little bit in a little bit. Uh, that has no uh, direct equivalent in English. It is not time as in seconds, minutes, and hours, and that's chronos, chronology, or, you know, watch a chronological timepiece. It's not that, but uh, more in the sense that it is a time for decision. It is a translated opportunity in Galatians uh, 16, as you have the opportunity to do good. It is the proper time or season of action, the exact or critical time to act. Paul admonished the Corinthian brethren to, uh, uh, quote unquote, awake to righteousness. First uh, Corinthians 15, chapter verse 34. <clears throat> Too much time has been wasted living in darkness, doing nothing in the service to God. Paul is saying that they have been too long asleep. Now they must awake out of sleep in a sense. Uh, that is, if they are to do anything in the way of preparation for eternity. So it's high time to do so, and not a second more must be wasted. <clears throat> and salvation spoken of here refers to the salvation that awaits the uh, faithful child of God when he quits the walk of this life in the flesh. As faithful children of God, they were already in possession of salvation from sin when they first believed and obeyed. But, but this is the completion of it in glory. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter, 1st chapter, verses 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to the, his abundant mercy has begotten us again to the living hope of the resurrection of, 
Jesus Christ from the dead to an, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. <clears throat> The salvation mentioned here becomes nearer and nearer, beginning with uh, first belief to the time of our departure. Since this is so, this present life, which is growing short, should be a time of preparation for the life to come. In verse 12, for the, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off or lay down in Acts 758 and put off in Ephesians 4.22 and putting away in Ephesians 4.25. We'll cover those again. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Paul continues his explanation of why it is high time to awake out of sleep. The first is that our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The second point is the night is far spent. That's kind of like first. Because the night is almost gone, it is time to wake up. The night refers to this life. It is almost gone. Therefore, we should be diligent to prepare ourselves for eternity. And that presents the third point, that the day is at hand. That is the heavenly day, the one eternal day. The day of final and eternal salvation. Now getting back to uh, cast off. It's the same Greek word as when, uh, you know, lay down their clothes at the feet of Paul in Acts 758. Or the same as put off the old man, which grows corrupt, Ephesians 4.22. Or the putting away lying, Ephesians 4.25. They're all the same Greek word. So it is to rid oneself uh, in the verse and the consideration. In the verses in Ephesians, the practices that are evil. We must cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The light of the gospel is the armor. We put on the armor by learning the gospel, incorporating it into our lives and and cherishing it. First, uh, Romans 13, verse 13, let us walk properly as is the day, not in revelry or in drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. So how do we awake out of sleep? As stated in verse 12, we are to cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. To walk in something is the conduct of one's life characterized by the walk, whatever that walk may be. We are to walk properly in the light of day, such that all may see our conduct and not be ashamed. That is, one does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. 1 Corinthians 13, chapter verse 5. Romans uh, chapter 13, verse, verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to, to uh, fulfill its lust. Instead of indulging in the things mentioned in verse uh, 13, we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on is the same as would be said in uh, donning clothing, putting on clothing. We are to be completely clothed are covered in the thing or by, or by the thing put on, in this case, Christ. We are to be completely under his authority 
and let him be our God. Beyond this, we cannot go. Short of this, we must not stop. Of course, we are to provide for the needs of the body, food, raiment, so forth. But we are not to yield to its fleshly desires. The fleshly desires are those unlawful desires or desires of unlawful objects. These fleshly desires are those that find their gratification in revelry, revelry in drunkenness, in lewdness and lust, in strife and envy. It said uh, in First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses two through ten. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. <clears throat> We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of the hope of salvation. <clears throat> For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should be together with him. <clears throat> and Paul said the, much the same thing in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 8 through 17. And I'll let you uh, read that at your leisure, but say much the same thing. <clears throat> but it does say there in the latter part of that, see that then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because of the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. <clears throat> in Romans, the 14th chapter, verse 1, and he's really getting on to a different subject. <clears throat> Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. So here, Paul now takes up the reciprocal duties of brethren who happen to be respectively strong or weak in belief relative to the use to be made of certain meats and days. <clears throat> He deals primarily with duties of the Christian regarding things indifferent in themselves. He sets forth the liberty we have in the absence of divine command and the duty we have in the absence of divine command. We may indeed be free to choose to act a certain way when alone, but may be bound to act entirely differently when with uh, with a weaker, a weak brother. Paul shows how the strong must act towards the weak, and how the weak must act towards the strong. He takes away from the strong the right of contempt, and from the weak the right of ignorant accusation. Paul also warns the Corinthian brethren against eating meat under circumstances that might lead other weaker brethren to eat certain meat in honor of an idol. To be weak in the faith is not to be weak in the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or in the truth of the gospel, that it is God's power to save. When a matter is clearly one of liberty, that is, a matter of personal scruples and not commandment, then accept him and let him have his own private opinions, which in themselves are indifferent to one's obedience to the gospel. If there is no command regarding his opinion, 
he has a right to hold these opinions without interference. And as long as these opinions do not lead him who holds them into wrong, he is not to be disturbed in holding them. <clears throat> in verse 2, For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. The strong one may not regard as special anything that he eats. To him it is just food. The weaker brother may be so concerned about meat, off, uh, meat offered to idols that he will eat only vegetables. Of course, the weaker brother would have no concern about meat not offered to idols. But he doesn't know if meat in the marketplace has been offered to idols or not. So he eats no meat. The stronger brother knows that meat is just meat. Having been offered to idols does not change the meat into something else. It is just meat suitable for consumption. He thanked God for it, ate it, and gave it no further thought. Now much of the meat offered in the marketplace had uh, previously been offered to idols. Idolaters were not about to lose a profit just because the meat had been sacrificed to their gods. The weaker brother regards eating meat offered to idols as an act of homage to the idol. Therefore, he is abhorred by the possibility. He would rather eat only vegetables than run the risk of eating such meat. <clears throat> uh, 1 Corinthians 8 addresses the concern some have about eating meat offered to idols. Now concerning things offered to idols, and we're in, uh, in 1 Corinthians first, uh, chapter 8, we know that we have all knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. <clears throat> now concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. It's just, uh, just nothing. For even if there, they, there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords among the heathen, of course. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, of whom all are all things, of whom are all things. And we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge, that's the weaker brethren, for some with consciousness of the idol, until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, <clears throat> and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, it is just food. For neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware lest someone, somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And thus to eat those things uh, in homage to an idol. And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died and that's a question for when you thus sin against the brethren and, and wound their weak conscience you sin against Christ therefore if food makes my brother stumble I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble so in verse uh, 3 of chapter 14 <clears throat> Let him not who eats despise him who does not eat, and let him who uh, let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. 
Uh, keep in mind that there are two types of Christians set forth by Paul here. The strong who eats all meat and the weak who does not. By implication, the strong man has the proper view towards eating meat, whereas the weak man does not. Accordingly, the strong man eating his meat with a clear conscience would be apt to look down upon the weak man who, do, who abstains. Now this uh, Paul forbid. After spiritual growth and maturity, the weak man <clears throat> may become the strong man and abandon his previously held scruples. The scruple and the action based on the scruple must be one of pure indifference as far as the gospel is concerned. If a weak brother deems it unnecessary to assemble with the brethren on the first day of the week to engage in worship of God, then his scruple must be disregarded and he himself uh, be rejected. Where the Bible speaks, the scruples cease to be a criterion of conduct. While we may respect another's scruples, they are not to control us. In a case of pure indifference, scruples are to restrain us. Otherwise, we are to constrain them. On the other hand, the weak brother who eats vegetables only and looks on eating meat offered to an idol as adultery likely will judge the strong a man as a sinner. Paul denies to the weak the right to judge. The strong is not doing wrong. It is not to be censured by the weak. The remedy for the weak is to make diligent inquiry of the strong man and thereby grow in maturity. Paul makes it clear that the strong man is accepted by God in the eating of meat offered to idols and therefore is not subject to judgment by the weaker brother. And uh, I think we'll defer uh, verse four, chapter 14 till next week since we're right at the end and we are at the end. So we'll begin uh, next time with uh, Romans, the uh, chapter, uh, chapter 14, verse four, and we'll continue this idea of weak and, and uh, strong Christians. Thank you.